You want muscles? You come to the right channel. More than American muscle here in the Audrain Museum Network. You're not a subscriber? Subscribe now! Hello and welcome to the Audrain Museum Network and the Audrain Automobile Museum's latest exhibition, More Than Just American Muscle. This is an exhibition which will examine the roots, the development, the disappearance, and the reappearance of the muscle car. Much like our land-breaking supercar exhibition that we did, this will also hopefully invite you, our viewer and our visitor guests here in the gallery, to examine what just is a muscle car because we're not going to define it for you. We will present cars and perhaps you will tell us that, yes, that's a muscle car, or really, that's a muscle car? We want to keep the dialogue going and ask as many questions, perhaps, as we answer. And to help us do that, I'd like to welcome the Executive Director of the Audrain Automobile Museum and Chief Curator, David Demuzio. Hello, Hello, David. Hello. This is a really interesting exhibition and one that really fits into that whole ethos that we have here at the Audrain. To have people come through that door or watch on the screen and see cars that they immediately love, they immediately knew, and some cars that they had no idea. Why is that here? Why is this here? What do you think about that, yeah. David? You want to start the con conversation. Clearly, muscle cars, the definition of muscle cars has to have changed since the early 70s. Uh, but I think people have differences of opinion, so that's, that's what this is all about. And as you can see in this opening shot here in this preview, you'll see three very different vehicles. This 1953 Aller J2X, a 1970 AMC AMX 390, and a 1969 Oldsmobile 442 Hearst Olds. The difference in these cars, we're having a conversation with a good friend of ours here at the museum earlier today, and he challenged me, and I thought this is really exciting because this talks to exactly what we want to do. Because isn't the Allard a racing car and isn't the AMX a sports car and isn't the 442 what most people consider a muscle car but there's reasons for each of these to be here. Now the Allard, let's talk about the 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 basic recipe of the Allard. Well it certainly comes from a race heritage it was created to race uh, and in Europe it did very well it came to America imported without an engine so we put American engines in them, typically a Chrysler Hemi or something like a Cadillac 331. So, um, yeah, it's an English car, but it has an American motor in it, and uh, it, it did well with them, so. And it also, perhaps, fulfills the one idea that some people have what a muscle car is, which is something with an engine bigger than it was intended to have from birth. And so that's one of the things that we'll be exploring both in this preview video and also in the in-depth video that we'll be doing throughout the run of this exhibition. And I'd also like to add that when you come to visit the gallery here and when you watch our videos, you'll also be given an indication of which of these cars you can also see here on the Audrain Network. Run and make noise because muscle cars are all about making noise. Right. We also have some references to earlier cars from the 40s and 50s that really uh, set the tone for the muscle car as we know it um, about 1964. Let's take a look at a couple of those icons in history. So the roots of the muscle car go a lot further back than most people realize, back to the late 1940s cars like the Hudson Hornet and then the uh, Futuramic Oldsmobile 88. These are very advanced engines for their time and prove their worth on the NASCAR racetracks. Yeah, so V8s that made it back to the road, so high horsepower. It's really the first inkling of, you know, a, two, a 289 small block that put, pushed out a lot of horsepower. Um, it related really to the race car. So. Um, more and more. So by, by the time we get to the to the early 60s uh, and we, you know, mid 60s, uh, we have some serious V8s on the road. So there's a history of putting lots of power in a family car. 
Right. And uh, right. The, the Detroit automaker sort of pushed it to the limit in some of the things. I mean, a, an Oldsmobile Cutlass was a family car. An HO455 Hearst Olds was a Cutlass in body, but not in spirit. Right. These are, big, these are big cars, but with a lot of horsepower. And I think, you know, the, the evolution, it really was a sedan that had more horsepower than people were used to, maybe. And that evolves into a coupe um, and gets sportier and sportier. But when you look at these antecedents, they really are family cars. And it's one of the things that is so fascinating about this show, with the exception, of course, of the Allard, which is an open two-seater, you realize that we've really lost the two-door hardtop. It's, it's a thing that was so ingrained, it's certainly in our youth, yeah. as you know, the hot car was a two-door hardtop. It's what every young guy, young girl drove until you got serious and settled down and got a four-door sedan or a station wagon. But the spirit of, of the two-door coupe, I think, is also very important to the spirit of a muscle car. Yeah, and they're still big cars compared to today. So, yeah, two, a two-door a two coupe, pretty big, though, you know? The, uh, one of the other forgotten stories which we have here in the art in the gallery is about the Studebaker Golden Hawk, which had the highest specific power output for weight of any car in the 1950s. It was really a superstar car. It was. And uh, it's, it's amazing that people forget about that, but we also have a spiritual descendant of that car, of course, in the AMC AMX 390, one of my favorite cars in the exhibition, and a car, again, which doesn't have a lot of attention, doesn't get a lot of respect. No, uh, these are worth exploring more. I think we need to do a little more detail on these at a later episode. Absolutely. Now, let's take a look at muscle then and muscle now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The exhibition runs from the 1953 Aller J2X to this 20. 18 Dodge Demon SRT. Now, it's also very interesting here in this corner of the gallery, we see quite the compare and contrast the then and now. This AA Arcuda and its spiritual successor, the Demon. These two cars are very, very different. Um, you'll see on the Audrey Museum Network great videos of both of these cars being driven. Uh, I drive this car, Jay and I drive the AA Arcuda, and it's remarkable how the philosophy had changed from 71 to 2018. Um, you know, this car has got a monstrous 290 horsepower engine. I mean, that was power. Well, that was laughable now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 840, anyone? Yeah. You know, and this is not the most powerful yeah. iteration of this model. Well, you know, we, we saw this movement towards retro design, which we all love. The Camaro does it, you know, um, Mopar does it as well. Um, but I keep thinking back to those days in the early 70s when, uh, when we had the gas crisis, yeah. um, you know, insurance rates were going up on muscle cars, um, emission standards change, and we really thought it was the death of high horsepower muscle cars. Little did we know that, you know, that with, with good engineering and design, <laughs> engines became, you know, a third the polluting and with three times the horsepower without even trying. So. Um, in, in 1973, we couldn't dream that this car would exist. Could you ever imagine seeing a 300 horsepower car again? No. no. Um, and it's also quite interesting that you mentioned that because that's one of the other things people talk about in the evolution of the muscle car. Sort of, why did the muscle car disappear? And there are a number of factors, you mentioned two of them, which are probably the biggest factor, the right. gas crisis and the insurance crisis. So people forget they do. Um, that these cars were aimed at young people and yet their insurance rates were higher than the very big engine four-door sedans that carry the same, yeah. same uh, equipment. So the insurance companies knew how these were going to be used, and so they thought, Let, let's hedge our bets and, yeah. and, and not really give in to these uh, things. And also, we'll, we'll see uh, in this exhibition as well, how sometimes the manufacturers aided and abetted their would-be customers in trying to find small loopholes yeah. uh, around certain restrictions that came up every yeah. now and then. Another, yes, and another thought is since you get to drive all these, we all do, that's the best part of our job, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, this is a rattle trap uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't stop and doesn't handle very well compared to any of the new cars. It's absolutely remarkable, and I actually, 
did remark uh, to a friend recently that it's very interesting, these two cars, there's no question that the Demon is four times as capable a car as this CUDA AAR is, but with the CUDA you get a real sensation of speed, yes. which you don't quite get in the Demon because right. it's so capable. But, you know, one of the other things is that, especially looking at this wonderful paint job on, on the CUDA, the cars of the 1970s, 60s and 70s, were also a big part of popular culture. And the next car we're going to look at is the absolute emblematic proof of that. <laughs> Great, let's go see it. I don't know where you were on some evenings back in the 1960s, but uh, I know that occasionally, maybe once or twice, I watched a really funny comedy show called Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. It was a breakthrough pioneering show in so many ways and launched so many great careers, but it highlighted a very veteran and seasoned performer, the legendary Sammy Davis Jr., who did this great skit about this judge. They had these ridiculous defendants in front of him in court, and the sort of the, the signature tag was, here come the judge. And it was so incredibly popular that Pontiac actually licensed Ronan Martin to use the name The Judge on their GTO model, The Judge. An amazing thing. I mean, it just shows how close cars and popular culture were at that time. Yeah, and brilliant marketing. Absolutely incredible. And of course, these cars are very serious. You know, The Judge may be a comic bit, but these are very, very serious performance cars. It's so great that they also had such fun with color. I mean, like this incredible, brilliant orange and the Mopar colors, you know, Plum Crazy and Grabber Orange and, and, and even with the Fords, you know, you saw it in the Boss 429s and the 302s, yeah. you even saw it in the Lamborghini Miuras, but that's yeah. another story. And it's just uh, this, it, this great kind of energy that these yeah, cars have. pop culture. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Now, um, this carried on this idea of great color. Me color means speed. And we're going to see it in the one motorcycle we have in this exhibition. So people can say, wait, hold on, this is a muscle car exhibition? Why do you have a motorcycle? Let's take a look at a very special motorcycle. Excellent. <laughs> the one motorcycle in this show is a bike with a very, very, very interesting and slightly bizarre name, the VRXSC V-Rod Destroyer. Destroyer? Why? What's up with this bike and, and why has it got that appendage at the back? Ah, uh, the wheelie bar, <laughs> ah. which you only see on drag bikes. This is the first and I think only uh, production uh, drag bike that Harley has ever built. Um, so you could buy this uh, and right out of the box go racing with it. Um, it's really based on the V-Rod architecture. It's an engine that was designed with the help of Porsche. Uh -huh. uh, so it has that interesting connection. Um, of course, this is a lots of um, race ready parts on it that uh, it's also not street legal. It's strictly a race bike, but screen, the, the performance division Screaming Eagle helped with a lot of the uh, some of the, you know some of the race parts that that helped this bike you know it's it's a v twin four valves per cylinder 165 horsepower um, it, you know it does a sub 10 second quarter mile you know this is this is a pretty impressive race ready bike you could buy and take to the track now guys also would modify these and make them even faster but um, Another interesting thing about this, which is really contrary to most things in our collection, is the zero mile, mile bike. It's never been ridden other than test driven at the factory. Um, so I don't know if we'll ever ride it or not. I hope we do. I sense an opportunity here. Maybe a track video with you drag <laughs> racing this? Uh, I think Lee Castleberry has dibs on this, but <laughs> our, our chief mechanic, who's definitely a Harley guy, uh, but I hate the idea of it never getting on the track. So. It would be quite a dramatic sight indeed. So thanks a lot, David, and uh, we'll see you on some of our more in-depth videos as the exhibition goes on. Good deal, Donald. Now we're gonna take a look at some of the other cars in this show.
And now we're going to see another couple of examples of the not American part of the not just American muscle exhibition. And for this, we're joined by my friend, Ben Chester. Donald. Ben, here we are with two other cars in the gallery that the people watching this and our visitor guests here might say, Ben, why are these two cars here? Well, what do we got here? We uh, had to change the <laughs> exhibition title so we could kind of fit some otherworldly stuff in here, to say the least. But that's why we've got these in here, to showcase the fact that during this period, it wasn't just America pumping out big horsepower, uh, straight line vehicles, but there was more to the story than just that. Anyone who watches this network on a regular basis, and you all should be watching it on a regular basis, can go here and watch us drive this Aston Martin Canadian Vantage and that Bizzarini 5300 Strata, and you'll get to know why these cars are in this exhibition. The combination of really big engines in surprising cars. These cars, both of them, are athletic in their own ways. Aston, obviously, for decades now, has been known as really the king of grand touring cars. So this car, uh, the V8 Vantage, has plenty of muscle, but it's a relatively lightweight car, being a Canadian example. The Bizzarini, as Bravo. some like Donald Bravo. says, uh, <laughs> is a very sporty car. Obviously, just looking at it, front mid-engine design, very slippery aerodynamics. Uh, with some serious race pedigree too, so it'll be fun to talk about those in the coming months. Absolutely, and uh, of course one of the things which is so interesting and provocative that we like to do here at the Audrain is to sort of set people in motion to thinking about, you know, what makes a muscle car to you? What makes a muscle car? Uh, big power, quick accelerations, and uh, high speeds, brother. It's also about attitude. I guess so. I mean, a lot of it is just how these cars really make an imprint on your mind. These, this era really bred a lot of enthusiasm in this country. And I know you were talking earlier about the colors and just the general shapes of these cars, but provocative is a good word for it because they just make people feel a certain type of way uh, when you're behind the wheel or even seeing them go by on the road. Well, we're going to look at a pair of cars with a lot of attitude and homegrown this time. Let's take a look at a pair of Mustangs. Let's do it. Ben, here we've got a pair of Mustangs with attitude. This 1970 Boss 429 and this 2017 Shelby Super Snake. Now, looking at these two cars, you get a crash course in the evolution of muscle cars. You know, this car compared to the original 64 uh, Mustang already feels bigger, heftier. This is another generation. Well, <laughs> this 429 is a crazy car. It's a NASCAR homologation car. They made 500 of them for Ford to be able to homologate this engine. Um, I guess I'll say in Porsche terms, compared to your 64 Mustang, this is like your 911 Turbo, so to speak. Uh, but this is definitely a straight line car, don't get me wrong. A lot of engine for what's going on here under the body. This Super Snake is a serious car all around. I mean, yeah, sure, it's in a muscle car show, but you've got Recaro seats, um, full roll cage, Brembo brakes, uh, full coilover system. It handles just as well as it goes straight, but with 650 horsepower, I think the driver is the limit. Uh, here. You can definitely tell, again, just as we looked at the other pair of the CUDA AAR and the Demon, the 429 and the Super Snake are very different interpretations of the muscle car theme. And again, here in the Audrain Museum Network, you can watch a video of this Boss 429 on the road and see it in action and uh, feel it. And I can tell you, as somebody who spent time behind the wheel and pressing that go <laughs> pedal, it is a... <laughs> An interesting beast, well shall said. we say. Well said, very diplomatic of you. This is as muscle car as uh, Ford really wanted to get. It's, it's no, it, I have no words for it. It's just, it'll kill you if you're not careful. And to take a look at another take on the muscle car and the slightly blurred lines that we've seen between sports car, muscle car, let's take a look at the blurred lines between customs and muscle cars in a pair of great pro touring cars. Take a look. Let's do it.
Now, the last pair of cards we're going to take a look at in this preview are a pair of cards which are quite interesting and also tells a wonderful story of rivalry, of course, you know, the great Chevy versus Ford rivalry. Here we've got two amazing custom builds, but in a very specific type of car. The Afterburner, built by the Ring Brothers, and Mark Stilo's The Mule. One based on the 64 Ford Fairlane, the other on the 1969 Chevrolet Camaro. And these are not just custom cars, they are pro touring cars. What's that all about? Well, these are very, very high quality custom builds. These are not just your normal, throw them together in the garage and throw them at an auction and see what happens. Uh, the Ring Brothers are really renowned for taking every single piece of the puzzle and modifying them. I'm not just talking about the engines, not just talking about the electric doors, but you look inside the door pulls, the, the vents for the air conditioning, the sun visor supports, everything is custom made in house. You see the carbon fiber right here is, is just all done in house. Um, serious build right here and they do a lot of crazy stuff. The mule was built by Mark Stilo in his garage actually, but Mark actually worked uh, for General Motors working on their development cars and that's kind of where the term mule comes from is when you're building a car as a test bed or as a concept car or a future production car, it's called a mule. Uh, but this was built as a, really the grandfather of pro touring cars, serious suspension setup, really well-rounded build um, that turned it into a car that really handled like a European sports car of modern times. And again, that whole blurring of the lines, a lot of people say, well, if you've got a smallish car with a really big powerful engine, like these have thousand horsepower engines in them, and they're designed to go in a straight line, that's great, then that's a muscle car, that's a hot rod, it's a dragster. But if it can turn, then, well, that's a sports car. But maybe you can build a hot straight line car that can also turn. Well, this mule actually has had two iterations. So from 2001 to 2003, they had a naturally aspirated 500 horsepower setup, which turned it into a really well-rounded car I'm a Camaro guy, I've always said, if I could have one car for the rest of my life, it's a first-gen Camaro. The car was then sold, and actually the engine was twin turbocharged, so now it pushes out a thousand horsepower and shreds tires like sheets of paper, and it's turned into a bit of both worlds. It still handles very well, obviously, but I think it has a bit more power than the uh, setup can handle at this point. In a pair of videos to be posted soon to the Audrey Museum Network, you'll be able to see and hear both these cars on the road as me and my dear friend Jay take them out for a spin and sometimes a burnout perhaps? Mm, a lot of spins. Um, <laughs> a lot of smoke. Um, but it's, it's really quite fascinating to see how this all comes together because we just love the idea of saying there isn't a simple answer to every question. Well, and that's true. And with muscle cars, there's obviously a certain kind of Ori that you think of, obviously the 429, the Cudas, the Judge, but that kind of enthusiasm has bred so much more out of that world, and it's cool to explore that over the next couple of months. Maybe it's power and attitude and performance and, and, and? Sure, yeah, whatever you say, it's all good. We'll find out. Let's do it. Thanks, man. Thanks, Donald. Thanks for joining us on this preview of our exhibition, More Than Just American Muscle, running here at the Audrain Automobile Museum from June 17th to September 10th, 2023. And of course, we want to invite you to look at all of the videos here on the Audrain Museum Network, but be sure to watch out for detailed videos which we'll be posting during the run of this exhibition to examine the story of the cars in the show in a little more depth. And of course, if you're not a subscriber, please do so and subscribe right now. Click the bell icon to be notified when we post new content, such as the detailed videos for this exhibition, our great driving videos, in the driver's seat with ABS podcast videos, and more, including our great Ask Alex series. On this program, I think there'll be a lot of questions to ask indeed. And I think that we want you to really think about what it is that makes a muscle car. In my opinion, Pontiac really got really close to it in their brochure for the 1964 GTO. What was it? A device for shrinking time and distance. If you agree, let us know. 
We'll look forward to seeing you back here on the channel. Thanks for joining us.